they don't have the urgency where the problem is at. And what they're doing is accommodating that. That's what the prisons are doing. as they are and to my comfort if I you know if my things are okay and I got what I need um, having somebody start knocking on the door of my country or my church or my house is threatening and and that's when they only understood their own worldview basically Christology meaning who Christ is with the work of Christ Jesus and the Spirit baptized in Acts 2 one who pours out of the Spirit upon, upon all flesh Hill's Global Church Project invites often unheard voices from around the world to enter into a powerful conversation about the shape of integral mission in the 21st century. It's an invaluable resource for deepening and broadening our understanding of the very future of the church. I don't know of any other source that provides as comprehensive a picture of the Global Church in mission as the Global Church Project. And in a sense, taking it even a step further into the reconciled existence. In the same way that we talk about the spirit dwelling. We should understand it's actually it's a neutral value. The sheer range of gifting, the sheer range of potential, the church is propelled forward by that. The diversity of voices represented here demonstrates the complexity and yet unity of the body of Christ around the world. Church Project. I had the opportunity um, quite a number of years ago now actually to travel all over the globe to visit countries right across Africa, Asia, Latin America, Oceania, and the Middle East, and to interview and film leaders from right across the globe, asking them to tell their stories. Uh, the goal is that we can learn from each other, that Asians would learn from African-American Christians, uh, African-American Christians would learn from Asian Christians, that Asian Christians would learn from Christians in the Middle East and so on, that there would be a global conversation where we would listen to each other and learn from each other and be enriched by each other's stories and perspectives like never before. One of the challenges for us in the West is that we're often locked into our own uh, sort of, you know, bubbles listening to only voices that sound like us uh, or that look like us. And that needs to change for us to be a global church. So this is a little project I've been a part of, and I've done about 350 films with Christian leaders from right across the globe saying, please tell us your story. Because no one needs a, a white, middle-aged Australian guy telling their story. Rather, inviting them to tell their own story so that we can listen and learn from what God is doing in the global church. Um, if you haven't realised already, I'm from Australia. You may have picked it up from the accent. Uh, in case you're wondering, this is how English will be spoken in heaven. So you've kind of got to get used to this accent if you're finding it a bit strange. If I say anything tonight that you disagree with, just put it down to the fact that you didn't understand me because of my accent, and then we should, all, we should be fine. Um, so today I wanna, tonight I want to explore a little bit about what is happening in the global church and how do we respond personally to what God is doing globally. I was listening to Haddon Robinson preaching, um, and he was telling the story of Dr. M Dr. Benjamin Rush. Dr. Benjamin Rush is one of the founding fathers of uh, the United States, one of those who signed the Declaration of Independence, but he was also one of the early founding uh, founders of psychotherapy. And he had a dream in his 30s that changed his life forever. In his dream, he saw himself standing in front of a great church in Philadelphia, 
And then in this dream, a man with wild eyes ran across the lawn of the church, scaled the walls of the building, ran across the building and wrapped his arms and legs around the weather vane. And Benjamin Rush in his dream turned to the people around him and said, what does this man think he's doing? And they said, well, he thinks that he can control the weather. Well, the man's efforts to control the weather weren't coming off so well. When he would turn the weather vane so there would be a nice gentle breeze, a hurricane would brew up. When he would turn the weather vane so that it would be just a nice shower, a scorching sun would arise. It was, everything was turning out the opposite of the way that he intended with his efforts to control the weather. At that moment in the dream, an angel descended from heaven, landed on the roof of the church and held a sign that merely said these words, about you today, a story is being told. And Benjamin Rush realized that he was the man in his dream, that all of his efforts to influence the the early nation had been to naught. And in politics, like in so many dimensions of life, when all is said and done, a lot more is said than done. He resigned from politics and quite sadly, never, never entered politics again. Well, the story of Benjamin Rush could be the story of you and me, a story of any of us. There are times when we feel disheartened, when we feel that we've given everything we can to the life of the church and to mission in the world, and when we see that the prayers of the church have dried up, that the compassion of the church seems to wane, when we see that the desire for mission seems to have drained away, and we begin to feel disheartened and discouraged. And it's moments like that When I feel discouraged, I look at the statistics about the decline of the American church or the Australian church. When I feel discouraged, I often turn my eyes to what God is doing globally. Because it's easy for us in the West to feel like things are going badly, that things are in terrible decline, when in fact the church is booming globally. It's growing more rapidly today than ever before. The church is bursting at the seams globally. There are more people coming to faith today than ever before, just as there are more martyrs today than ever before. It's just that the center of gravity of the church has shifted from the global north, North America, Australia, Europe. It's shifted away from the global north, what we might call Western countries, to the global south, and the East, so to Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so on. There's been a seismic shift in our generation, which is difficult for us sometimes in the West to get our head around. And the stories coming out of the global church can renew our mission, invigorate our worship, give us a fresh desire to serve God in meaningful ways and to participate with what God is doing across the global church. So let's have a look at, oh, thank you, you've already, you already got there. Look at the shifts that are happening. Um, in 1900, 82% of Christians globally lived in North America and Europe. So a significant proportion of the Christian, Christians globally were, were located in those areas. By 2020, so 120 years later, 67% of Christians now live in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. So in 120 years, there's been a seismic shift. It's as though Christianity has been turned upside down, and now the center of gravity is no longer in the global north, it's in the majority world. So I call Africa, Asia, and Latin America the majority world because the majority of the world's population is there as well as the majority of the church. That's where Christianity is today. Some statisticians tell us that probably by 2050, it's possible that more than 80%, even possibly 85% of the world's Christians will be in the majority world. Africa, Asia, Latin America, Oceania, and the Middle East, um, and so on. So there's been a significant shift that's happened today. Uh, Next slide. Uh, The shrinking of the global north, the Christianity in the global north, and the rise of the global south, or I like to to use global, I like to use majority world, uh, because the east isn't in the global south, Asia. 
So the rise of the majority world is a critical feature of world Christianity today. Um, and just as a lot of the intellectual and financial power still re resides in North America and Europe, so a lot of the vitality and renewal and energy and theological innovation now, I think, is arising in the majority world or the global south. With Christians found in every corner of the globe, we're not a homogenous or monolithic group anymore. In fact, the average Christian today doesn't look anything like me. I don't look anything like the average Christian today. The average Christian today is, a, is female and, and living in an African village or a uh, Brazilian favela. She doesn't look anything like me. She doesn't speak English, but she is a part of the renewal of the church today. And I think that's exciting. That's something to celebrate. And it's something to think about in terms of what does it mean for us as believers today? The way we think about mission, the way we think about theology, the way we think about the church globally. Next slide. There are five major shifts that are going on globally today. Uh, now, these are big, scary words. I'm an academic, so I don't talk like a human being, if you haven't noticed. My, you know, my children sometimes say to me, when I'm talking at the table, they say, Dad, just stop and talk human for a while. But there are five major shifts that are happening. Polycentricity, polyvocality, integrality, um, interculturality, and Pentecostality. So let me describe what each of those are. The first one, the church now is polyvocal. So instead of just listening to one voice that sounds a lot like, that's in English, that is white, that is educated, the church now is a polyvocal community, and we need to listen to and honour and respect the diversity of voices, and especially those voices that have been historically marginalised and silenced. We need to be a truly polyvocal community. The church is polycentric, and by that I mean that, take mission for instance, it's no longer the West to the rest, it's everyone to everywhere. It's, it's Africans going, serving on mission to North America. It's Asians going to Latin America. It's Latin Americans going to the Middle East. It's everyone to everywhere. And the center of gravity, the center of influence is no longer just in one place. And it can't be anymore. We've got to think about multiple centers, a, a polycentric vision of, of Christianity today and of Christian mission today. Thirdly, the church is intercultural, and that means we've got to recognise the cultural location of our form of Christianity. The way we do worship, the way we think about theology, the way we think about mission has been shaped by our language, by our culture, by our traditions. But now we're living in an intercultural age where cultures, not just multicultural, not just cultures standing side by side, but informing each other, enriching each other, speaking into each other's lives, an intercultural world. And that's an exciting world, I think. You know, if you get 20 people from different cultures in a room and you ask them to, to tell us what the, the parable of the Good Samaritan means, you'll often get 20 different interpretations. The reason is because our interpretations of Scripture are, are almost certainly not neutral, they are shaped by our culture, by our worldview, and so on. And so that's the rich diversity of, of the global church and learning from each other. Integrality is about, one of the other shifts is the fact that we're learning that we can no longer live in a kind of dichotomized or polarized world where we talk about sacred versus secular, gospel proclamation versus social justice, Caring for the earth versus political engagement. Those kind of polarities don't make sense to the global church. You know, Western, the Western intellectual tradition is one that has been shaped by polarities. And we've kind of introduced those polarities across the globe. But these days, most Christians today don't, can't think in those terms. If you're looking, living in a poor village and you've come to faith, you can't imagine a gospel that doesn't involve caring for creation. 
engaging in justice, being a voice in, in terms of politics for the gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the gospel in courageous ways and integrating all of these things in a holistic picture. Of course, the phrase integral mission comes out of Latin America. It's, um, and then lastly, Pentecostality. This is the idea that the Spirit is propelled forward in the power, presence, provision of the Holy Spirit. The church is propelled, pro propelled forward in that way. We live dependent on the Holy Spirit. Julian Wonsuk Ma once said, what Westerners call Pentecostalism, Asia calls Christianity. You know, the church when it is at its best, I think, is renewalist, where there's a deep passion for the Word of God, a deep desire to proclaim the gospel, and a deep reliance on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit moving us forward. So these are shifts that are happening globally and that we can get a, become a part of. Um, because I don't speak, because I am an academic, I've come up with a weird, strange word for this, and I call it holistic hostile mission. And you can find it, if you Google Missio Alliance, holistic hostile mission, you'll see a blog post that I've written on each of these five dynamics and you'll be able to read up, up on them in much more detail and I'll be um, dealing with them in a forthcoming book as well. So there are significant shifts. Next slide. What does this mean for us though personally? I think one of the challenges for us personally is we need to have, we need to be converted to what Christ is doing. You know, as, as believers, we go through a series of conversions. There's our initial conversion, but there are ongoing conversions to the Spirit and to the dynamism and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be converted. We need to con convert it to what God is doing and cooperate with what God is doing in the world. And I'm going to kind of riff for the rest of this talk. I'm going to be talking about the story of Jonah and how the dynamics in the life of Jonah speak to us today in terms of how we respond to what God is doing. So I'm going to deal with that biblical book and use it as, a, as an allegory for our own engagement with God in the world today, given all that I've just said. And I'm going to be drawing heavily on this particular book, Eugene Peterson's Under the In Unpredictable Plant. Um, Eugene Peterson has passed away, of course, but he's a wonderful spiritual writer. Um, when we look at the story of Jonah, so we go to the next slide. When we look at the story of Jonah, there are a couple of movements in his life that speak to how we can have open hearts to joining with God in mission in the world. When the storms of life come, when we're tempted to run away from God, when we try to box God into our agenda and our vision, how does God call us to be a different kind of people where the world is changing around us, where those shifts in global Christianity are in our face? What kind of people do we need to be and how do we need to be converted to what God is doing in the world? So let's kind of explore that question through the story of Jonah today. And you may remember the story of Jonah. You may not know of the story of Jonah. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, son of somebody. Who? Oh, yeah, I, I can't quite pick that up. The, the American accent isn't pure English, so... <laughs> the, Mary, the, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, son of somebody, uh, and says, go to Nineveh and preach repentance because her sin is so great. And you may, you may know the story. Jonah says, no way, Jose, am I going to Nineveh to preach repentance? And instead, he gets on a boat, he sails west across the Mediterranean, fleeing the voice of the Lord. A great storm brews up and it threatens to tear the ship apart. And the sailors who were seasoned men of the ocean, these are guys who don't get afraid of great storms very often. They think they're going to die and they, they cast lots. The lot falls on Jonah and they've already been told by Jonah that he's fleeing the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. They say, what have you done? And Jonah says, well, I'm fleeing God. If you pick me up and throw me into the ocean, then this storm will subside. So they, they, 
They try to battle the elements. They try anything but throwing Jonah into the water. And finally, they do throw him in. The storm subsides. Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. He's in the belly of the fish for a long time. We'll explore this in a moment. And then he's vomited onto dry land. And imagine this scene. His eyes are blood red. His skin is pasty white. It's been bleached by the gastric juices of the whale's belly. He's covered in seaweed and fish guts and bones. There might be an anchor weight tied to his leg. That was a bit much, wasn't it? He he drags himself hand over hand into Nineveh saying, repent, repent, repent. And the Ninevites think this is either a prophet of God or a madman. And they go with the former and repent. Nineveh repents. God relents and Jonah is furious. He goes up into a mountain still hoping for fireworks and has the biggest pity party recorded in ancient texts. It's a remarkable story and it's easy for us to think it's some kind of a fishy tale or something like that. I know that was bad, but It's a story that might speak to us as disciples of Jesus Christ, particularly when we come across moments in our discipleship that prevent us from joining with God in God's mission in the world. So let's explore different parts of that story and say, what actually is going on in this story that can speak to us about how we cooperate with God in this seismic shifts that is going on in the world today? So Jonah chapter 1. The story begins. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, son of Amittai, (laughs) and says to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach repentance. And Jonah says no, and he jumps on the boat and heads west across the Mediterranean. When I first read this, I thought, why? Why would he jump on a ship and head west across the Mediterranean towards Joppa? And it's easy for us as as modern readers to miss what's going on here. You see, Nineveh in the ancient mind was, Nineveh was this ancient, fearful city built layer upon layer of unhappy history. It was a city that had been built on violence and bloodshed. And the ancient peoples of the world They were terrified of the Ninevites. They'd heard all the stories that when the Ninevites would conquer a surrounding nation, that that their brutality was legendary. By some accounts, you know, they would would take off the heads of the warriors of that city and put them on stakes leading up to the gates of the city, saying, you don't mess with the Ninevites. So the ancient people, when they thought of Nineveh, they were terrified. And when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and says, go to Nineveh, Jonah says, God, haven't you been reading the newspapers? Don't you know anything about Nineveh? This is a death warrant. And then Jonah thinks of Joppa, which is on the coast of Spain, which is described in Two Kings as this exotic location full of peacocks and rare animals and gold and silver and myrrh. I've been to the coast of Spain with these long white beaches, these aqua waters and the dolphins jumping out of the water. And Jonah thinks to himself, I can go to Nineveh and be beheaded or worse, or I can go to the coast of Spain, to Joppa and lie on a banana lounge somewhere, sip on a martini and soak up the rays of the sun. And so Jonah flees from the voice of the Lord. He runs as fast as he can. He says, there's no way I'm going to do what the Lord is asking me to do. But you and I know that when it comes to God's voice, you can run, but you can't hide. You can flee the voice of the Lord. And often what we run to is our own kind of jopper our own sort of Tarshish. We have this sort of image of Tarshish in our mind. I don't know what Tarshish looks, for you, looks like for you. It's a, some form of idolatry, inner idolatry that you run to when the voice of the Lord comes to you. But when the voice of the Lord comes to you and says, go, go, 
Will you respond? Will you listen to his voice calling you, drawing you, inviting you to cooperate with God in what God is doing in the world? One of the things that prevents us is that we have these inner Tarshishes, this kind of inner image of what life should be like, and we go to that instead of what God is doing. I know I keep calling it Joppa, but I meant to say Tarshish. It's been a long, long trip. And so Jonah is fleeing the voice of the Lord, and he ends up on a boat, and he ends up in this, this incredible storm. And you know the story where the storm brews up, and the ship is about to be torn apart. It looks like everyone in the ship is about to die. And Jonah's storm is very similar to the storm that Paul finds himself in, in Acts chapter 27. In both stories, so in Jonah's storm and in Acts chapter 27, the, um, the chief actors are headed west across the Mediterranean. In both stories, a great storm brews up. In both stories, it looks like the ship is going to be sunk and that these, everyone is going to die. But that's where the similarities end. You see, in Jonah's story, Jonah is prayerless, independent, self-willed, running away from the voice of the Lord. Whereas in Paul's story in Acts 27, Paul is prayerful, reliant upon God and pursuing God's call on his life. When the storm brews up and it looks like the ship's about to be torn apart, Jonah turns to the sailors and says, I know what to do. I know what to do. Pick me up and throw me overboard. But that's Jonah all over. Jonah always knows what to do. Jonah is the guy who just follows his own path, pursues his own destiny. Even when the voice of the Lord comes to him, Jonah is still doing his own thing. You know, we sometimes think of prophets as these wild men of the desert, dressed in animal skin, you know, drinking honey, eating wild animals, whatever it might be, wandering the deserts. Well, Jonah is not that kind of prophet. Who can afford a boat ride from the Middle East across to the coast of Spain only with someone with a lot of means, a lot of money? Jonah has wealth, he has determination, he has self-interest, and when push comes to shove, in the middle of the storm that threatens his whole life, what comes out is Jonah's, all that Jonah is, I know what to do. Here's what to do. Whereas Paul is the exact opposite. He falls on his knees and he cries out to God, dependent on God, seeking God. You and I find ourselves regularly, if we follow Christ into mission, in the middle of a storm. You know, storm trouble, extreme trouble, is where we find out who we really are, where our degrees, our language, our culture, our accomplishments mean nothing. We discover that we are not in control of our own destiny, that those things can be ripped away from us at any time. Our sense of control is an illusion. And when we join God on mission, we'll find ourselves regularly called to join God rather than run away from Him. And we'll find ourselves in the middle of extreme storms where we feel overwhelmed and powerless, and fearful, and in the middle of storm trouble. But it's exactly in that place that God shapes us and moulds us and renews us into the image of His Son. Getting rid of all those things that we've depended upon, that we've relied upon, pulling us back to the bare basics, converting us again to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's when we lose control and we let go of everything that God begins to do an incredible work on our lives. And the story goes on. Jonah is thrown into the water and he's swallowed by a great fish. And Jonah chapter 2 is Jonah's kind of psalm of lament or prayer of lament within the belly of the fish. And he says these words. I mean, imagine the scene. Jonah is in the belly of, of the fish 
It sinks down into the depths of the ocean. He can't see his hand in front of his face. His nostrils are filled with the stench of the gastric juices. He's suffocating. He believes in this dark place, in the belly of the whale, in the depths of the ocean, I'm going to die. And in that place, he finally gives up and cries out to God. He says, in my distress, I cried out to the Lord and he answered me. From the depth of the realm of the dead, I cried out for help and you listened to my cry. You held me into the deeps, into the very heart of the seas. The current swelled over me. The waves broke over me. I said, I'm banished from your sight. I thought, this is where I die. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. But you, O oh God, are the God of the ages who hears my prayer. You know, often I'm a, I'm a, because I live right on the coast, I'm a body surfer, so I regularly go out into the ocean, I, I catch waves, but I'm getting old. I'm in my mid-50s now. I'm not the swimmer I was in my 20s. And there'll be times when I'm catching a wave and then I'll, I'll, I'll be pummeled. And you know that feeling where a big wave crashes over you and you reach up for air and the wave crashes over you again and you reach up for air and crashes over you and you can't get oxygen and you think, this is where I'm going to die. Well, I meet people all the time, that's what their life is like. I was talking to an older lady just recently and she was telling the story about how her husband had had an affair her son had died from cancer, she'd lost her job, then she discovered she also had her own illness and it felt like the waves were crushing over her time and time again and maybe you've been in that place. Well, it's in the belly of the whale, in the dark night of the soul, where we have no other hope but Christ alone, that we can cry out to God and God is present in that darkest of places to be our comfort to be our security, to be our hope. I've suffered from depression most of my adult life. Um, and sometimes it can be utterly, it can be overwhelming. I'll have some weeks where I can barely get out of bed. The depression is so severe. And there are many times in that darkest of places where I think I just can't go on that somehow, by God's grace and the love of people around me, I feel that there is hope that I can get through this. Jonah learns in the darkest of places, he cries out. This is kind of like a psalm of lament, isn't it? In the darkest of places, he says, I will shout praises to God. I will sacrifice to you. Salvation comes from God alone. Wherever we find ourselves, when we cooperate with me in mission. When we find ourselves fleeing from God, you can run, but you can't hide. In the storms of life, God is present with us, refining us, drawing back to Him. In the dark night of the soul, where we think all is hopeless and lost, where we think we can't go on, we hear these words, salvation comes from God alone. And the story goes on, Jonah goes into Nineveh, in Jonah chapter 3, he goes into the great city of Nineveh to proclaim repentance. And imagine Nineveh. Nineveh was this great religious city with these great temples built to the gods. When you would walk along the streets of Nineveh, you would see idols everywhere. You'd see these great temples. You'd smell the incense burning because the Ninevites were very religious people very religious people. And Jonah goes into Nineveh and says, yet 40 days, yet 40 days, if you do not repent, the maker of the heavens and the earth will come in great judgment. And we shouldn't miss that, that wording because the image of 40 comes up a lot in Scripture, doesn't it? You know, the 40 days of Noah's ark were about purging away and cleansing people from moral pollution that they might return to God. 40 years in the wilderness were about purging and refining a people that would be set apart to God as a light and a witness to the world. 
The 40 days of Elijah's run from Jezebel were about purging him and, and uh, from what was going on in his spirit. The 40 days of Jesus um, in the desert and then his resurrection appearances. So this image comes up again and again and again. And it's a, this image is about God coming to a person or a group and cleansing away our idolatry, our selfishness our self-will, because the Ninevites, they were very religious, but they'd shaped God in their own image. Their gods were gods of greed and violence and lust, a lot like our gods today, by the way. If you only need to look at social media or, or the latest news, you see that the gods today are exactly the same, the gods of greed and violence and lust and consumerism, whatever they might be. And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and uh, uh, comes to Nineveh and says, yet 40 days, you've got a choice. Will you cooperate with my spirit and be purified and refined and made new in order to serve me? Or will you suffer my wrath and judgment? And what, so that word comes to Nineveh, but what terrifies me is that when that kind of word comes to people in, in the Gospels, it's usually through Jesus to religious people. It's not to secular people. It's to people like me who love, who love Jesus, who try to follow Jesus, who but sometimes can get caught up in the ways of the world. Our politics, our consumerism, our desires, our ways of life begin to look like the gods of this world rather than the ways of Christ. And the, the Spirit comes to us and says, Graham, Joan, Bob, whatever your name is, yet 40 days. Will you cooperate with my Spirit? Will you relinquish an image of me that has been shaped in your own image? and the idols that you've lusted after, and pursue after me, that I might refine you and renew you and have you as a people unto my own. When we're going to cooperate with God in mission, that's often one of the things that happens. God begins to burn away all of those things. We get confronted with our own idolatries, our own desires, our own yearnings, that we might be a people fully consecrated to God, that we might serve God with what God is doing in the world today. As I said, Nineveh repents and God, relent, uh, God relents. And then in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah is furious. Do you remember the end of the story? Jonah is furious. He says, oh, come on. This is exactly like you, God. You're compassionate. You're gracious. You're slow to anger. You're so disappointing. <laughs> you know, Jonah, Jonah is so disappointed. And he even tries to rewrite history a little bit. He says, you know, this is why I didn't go to, to Nineveh in the first place because, oh, you know, you're just such a compassionate God. So what was the point? Now, we all know that's not really why he didn't go to Nineveh, but he's kind of rewriting history a little bit. Jonah is so upset at God that God doesn't fit his agenda. God is showing himself to be bigger, more gracious, more good, if there's such a term, than he could ever imagine. And then Jonah, having this pity party, still thinking that this story is about him. By the way, I don't think this book should be called Jonah. He still thinks that this story is about him. He sits down under a plant. It, it, it grows up and gives him shade. God sends a worm. The worm eats the plant. The plant dies. The sun is beating on his head. And he wakes up and he's just, could life get any worse? I mean... I've travelled, I, I, I gave up the coast of Spain, I've, I've been in the belly of a whale, now God has not destroyed Nineveh, could life get any worse? And God says to him, Jonah, Jonah, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and the end of the story is quite, 
profound. Because I think that what Jonah says, what God says to Jonah is, Jonah, you're a prophet, but you still don't know me. You don't understand who I am. You don't see my love, my bigness, my grace. You don't see that this is not about you. You're part of a bigger story than you could ever imagine. And then it ends. The story ends in a very strange way. If you look at chapter 4, verse 10, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah when he's having this pity party and says, you've been concerned about this plant. You didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And shouldn't you have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and many animals as well. And that's where the story ends. Now, I'm a writer. and When I first read this story, I thought, what? Who ends a story like that? Like you read those final words. Shouldn't you be concerned about Nineveh? There are 120,000 people. They can't tell their right hand from the left. And there's many animals too. The first time I read this, I thought, what on earth? You know, did the narrator, was he making a porridge or something? And then he was writing the story and the porridge started to boil over and he never got back to the story or something. It's just a weird ending. When I, when I talk to some of my students about writing, I say, you've got to have a strong introduction, a strong conclusion. You don't just leave things hanging. But I think this is done on purpose. Because the question that God poses to Jonah is the question that he poses to me, that he poses to you. The question that God poses is a question that resounds through the ages. It's a question to the ancient hearer. It's a question to the ancient church, to the church throughout generations, to the gathering at um, New, New Wilmington Mission Conference 119 years ago and to you and I today. And the question is, will you join with me in what I'm doing? Will you see me for who I am? Will you allow your small, jaundiced, narrow view of who God is and what God is doing globally to be broken and bent and destroyed in front of your very eyes, that you may join with me in my great mission in the world? That's the question. See, Jonah is suffering from a lapse of self-centeredness, a smallness of spirit, a hardness of heart, and God wants to break that and bend that and destroy that and create something new in him. And that's what I love about this story because the same word comes to us today. When I began, I looked at the changes happening globally and they demand a response from us, a response of mission for sure, but also a response of discipleship, a heart response. Now, the story of Jonah says to us that when the voice of the Lord is coming to us and doing something new and calling us to join with him, there are different things that can go on in our lives. The first one is this, you can run, you can flee, you can try to escape to Tarshish, but you can't hide from what God is doing, not only globally, but also in your life. And when you find yourself in the middle of a storm and you feel that everything that you thought was precious and dear, everything that shaped your identity and sense of self is being ripped away from you in that great storm that you'll face, God is there doing something in your spirit. When it feels at times that you just can't go on, you've lost hope and it's a dark place where you think this is the end, in that very place, the Spirit reaches out to you, doing something in you and your spirit where you say, salvation belongs to the Lord. In those moments when we join with God and we realize that like Nineveh, we've shaped God in our own image, that the God we follow looks like the gods of this age that the idols of our culture are the very images that shape our picture of God. God wants to dismantle all of those idols, burn them away and, and reshape our image of who God is and what God is doing in the world, that we might be disciples of Jesus Christ fully and wholly. 
And then finally, at the end of the story, we read that the Spirit of God wants to do something in our hearts and invite us into God's mission, into God's story. The Spirit says, Jonah, Graham, New Wilmington attendees, will you join with me as I do something new in the world, as I reshape your heart and give you a new passion to join with me and follow me as disciples on mission for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, today, as we stand before you, we recognize that we can't do any of this in your strength, that we need your grace and your power and your presence. Cause us to be a people who realize that this story is not ours, but we join with the hosts of heaven, with the diverse communities across the globe, with believers across the ages to join in this great mission of the redemption of all of humanity and all and the restoration of all of creation. In Jesus' name, amen.